Hello there guys, it's Joey and this is this week's YouTube Pagan Challenge question which is how we feel about the will of the year or the festivals and I kind of put this off a little bit for a couple of reasons uh, one is I'm still Migraine City so if I say nonsense I apologise and you know why um, <laughs> I'm going to try and just take it slow uh, and secondly, because it's kind of a difficult thing for me to sit here and really uh, give more than I've already done and try and give something different on the subject. So I think we'll, we'll attack it like this. Um, <laughs> so yes, I do actually follow most of the, in fact all of the Wheel of the Year. When I started in the very, very beginning, as I have mentioned on numerous occasions, I started off with a wicker focused from, from book wicker. And I think really it was just the accessibility of it. And I have many fond memories of learning because of uh, books to do with wicker. And I've still got some of them. I don't think I've got any to hand easily. I've got some just, just there. And, uh, I have many, many fond memories and I owe Wicca and those Wiccan books a great debt because they were accessible, they enabled me to to learn and to seek out the very beginner books back in the very beginning of my path and a big part of that was the Wheel of the Year and that would come up in a lot of the Wicca and beginner witchcraft books. It, it seemed to be something that got, I don't want to say lumped in, but it kind of feels a bit like that, uh, lumped in with a lot of witchcraft books because it was a popular idea or an accessible thing to do. And there are those who to this day will say, you know, oh it's a wicked thing, I don't, I don't like it, I don't follow it, blah blah blah. And I understand that point of view. I understand that some people want to disassociate themselves entirely from uh, a Wiccan path once they have found what their path is. But for me, I'm a Celtic witch now. Uh, it's how I define myself if, if absolutely required. Uh, and, you know, four of the big festivals are Celtic in origin. And given that I think. I personally feel that celebrating the festivals is just a beautiful act of celebrating nature, of connecting with the world around us and really getting up and celebrating uh, one's path is something that I feel is really key and really important to the fact that paganism shouldn't be solemn and, and dull and boring all the time or or ever but you know how you know so like you should be celebrating your spirituality you should be enjoying it you should be uh finding the laughter finding the joy finding the the fun and that's something that kind of gets vetoed like if you're having fun with it you're not being serious about it and it's like well that's not true really is it um I don't think it is. If, if you're not enjoying it, you're doing something wrong. It's kind of like, well, if you, you're really not enjoying it, what's the point? So, yeah. If, if it's not speaking to you on a soul level, if it's not making your heart dance, if you're not getting up and feeling like, yeah, then you've lost your excitement, you've lost your joy, and it's probably lost your way. So, there are many videos on my channel already where I talk about uh, rituals and spells and altar setups and all this sort of thing for each individual uh, sabbat and if you have been with me for any length of time or at all then you will probably know that I'm a little bit obsessed with Samhain, Halloween, All Hallows, however you want to call it and this has been true all my life. I only have to reach over here, 
Halloween decoration. <laughs> I can't. Okay, you stand there. Or down here, in fact. Hang on. <laughs> and uh, yeah, <laughs> my whole house is house shows signs of uh, Sawai in love, and I couldn't fully explain it to you as a kid. Uh, as a kid, I just preferred it to every other holiday, including. Like, you know, your Christmases and your things where you've got presents. I just, I really, really loved everything about it. It spoke to my soul and I wasn't, I wasn't there yet. So I didn't fully understand it yet. But, um, the visuals and the, the, the carved pumpkins and dressing up like a witch every year and oh, everything about it, everything about it, I loved it. And it wasn't such a big deal in England as it, as it is now. Uh, or as it is in America, and America just, they go mad with it, and they have the most amazing decorations, and here it gets more and more difficult, which, I, I could tell you my Tory conspiracy theory with Halloween, but uh, we won't. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, Halloween, as I said, that, it, it spoke to me, it excited me, it it really sort of woke something up in my soul very, very early on. And it had always been that way, even before I knew what path I was on and when I'd started out on the path. And, you know, it just excited me and uh, thrilled me in a way that no other holiday ever did. And later when I found out that uh, Samhain is associated with the Morrigan in her, her path working and the Dagda and uh, getting a Don, uh, it became even more significant. I was like, oh, okay. And that feeling of specialness and connectedness and one of those clues about who my matron would eventually be is so tied into the wheel of the year, therefore, that it seems almost incompatible with my line of, of a thought and feeling that I would give up celebrating the wheel of the year. Excuse me. Also, uh, Imbolg is one of the only festivals that I have actually celebrated with a group of people. I did that while I was in Canterbury many years ago. I'm going to have a sip of water, excuse me. <coughs> and it was absolutely beautiful. I haven't been able to do it since. But the memory of it, the memory of that sort of celebratory going into the woods and holding ritual with a group of people was life-changing. It was, it was beautiful, it was connective and I was really upset that I couldn't stay in uh, Canterbury for one reason or another and it's been something that I've never been able to repeat since for you know, a numerous amount of reasons for you know one reason or another but I am mostly solitary and I think there are pros and cons to celebrating the Wheel of the Year being solitary, which is my personal experience. On the con side, it can be really freaking lonely. And for Samhain, around Samhain, I nearly always try and see my sister and my nephew. And my nephew is just as much of a Halloween freak as I was. So my sister's got that to, every year to look forward to twice. <laughs> He wants to come here every year because he's like, I want to see the decorations. <laughs> I want to see Auntie Jojo's uh, museum of ha where Halloween things go and never come back. It basically becomes Halloween town. I have videos, so you know you can you can see that for yourself. <laughs> we go mad for Halloween. I love it. So I mean, it's just I'm, we celebrate the serious side too, of course, but you know the the, the joy is there. So there is a little bit of a loneliness attached to celebrating the Wheel of the Year by yourself. And sometimes it can get a bit, you know, when you like, you're you celebrating and you're keeping your joy up and you're honouring the gods and you're going out in nature and then you get that thought creep in, which is, I wish I had someone to share this with. <laughs> I wish there were witches nearby. Uh, and it's kind of sad, really. But on the plus side, you don't have to uh, cater to anybody else's tastes. 
I'm a Finnick and I like, I'm a Virgo so I like things the way that I like them. I like my spell setups and my altar setups the way that I like them. I like the words that I like to use in my rituals. You know, I like my scents that I like in my candles, incenses, whatever. Uh, and <laughs> when you were uh, sharing a space with someone you had to be more diplomatic than that and less bossy than that. And, you know, I guess that throws into relief all kinds of problems or, to, or you know, a different variety, a different kind. Uh, so there is that. There, there is the ability to define what you're doing when it's just you and it's just your relationship with the divine and you celebrating the way that you know you want to celebrate. And I talk about this a little bit in certain Sabbat videos. Uh, that I have traditions all of my own that, you know, I've sort of felt I wanted to do and they've just become part and parcel of my traditions. So at the autumn equinox, for example, I will take apple slices to the graveyard and I sort of leave them as offerings, particularly for the forgotten dead. And uh, it's something I've talked about three or four years since you know I've been on YouTube uh, and I've been doing it longer than that and I've always taken apple slices for the forgotten dead at the equinox not on Samhain. I take them on the equinox because it seems to me to be important to be honouring them and you know leaving them gifts and, and connecting with them on that point of that equin that equinotic point uh, as well as the fact that quite often you might be asking for things at Samhain you, know, you might be asking for help with divination or spell work or whatever or, you know you, even if you're just calling your ancestors uh, it's kind of like a request thing going on at Samhain so I think it's better in preparation for that to already have set the set the tone at the equinox of giving of not asking for something at the equinox so that's something I always do and then at uh, Beltane I take rose petals and for the forgotten dead so at these two big points of the year and these are two big Celtic points of the year uh, that I go and honour the forgotten dead that I, th I think it's one of the saddest things in the world when you see gravestones that have fallen into disuse and no one cares anymore and you know that it's just love and life that was and existed and it's not even acknowledged anymore. I think it's one of the saddest things in the world and having a close relationship with a goddess who carries the dead across the threshold it kind of feels a bit like a responsibility, a duty and an honour to at least say some words and leave some rose petals for the forgotten dead in my area, I think. It's, it's an important connection with cycles of life and death and I think most, if not all, of the Sabbaths celebrate these great cycles of life and death that is important for which is to connect to. It's more difficult I think for people on the southern hemisphere because most of your setups uh, revolve around the northern hemisphere, around the way the cycles of nature and what's going on in the world or should be going on in the world because this year is bonkers, we've not had a winter here. Um, is Northern Hemisphere and I, I was thinking it to myself it's, it's kind of sad that you know you don't see people rewriting them and, and really sort of taking into account the fact that the seasons are flipped on the other side of the world but there you go I'm gonna get some of you southerners over for, for, for a proper Halloween <laughs> I can't imagine ha Halloween in, uh, in sort of summery time <laughs>
Right, I've totally lost my trailer thought thinking about how I can get a load of southerners over to England. <laughs> oh dear. Um, so the cycles of nature are quite important to embrace when you are working on a nature-based witchcraft path, which most of us are. Not all of us. Uh, I talked recently about, you know, becoming more aware of paths which I'm not ever going to walk, but, you know, different ways of doing things uh, based in technology and so forth. But for most of us, when we are working in a nature-based path, however you want to describe it, uh, if most of us have come to paganism because of a deep connection to nature, a spiritual uplifting that touches our soul in such a way that when we look at the world around us, it speaks to us and certain times of the day, certain types of weather, certain seasons, certain things in nature, certain trees, certain plants, certain flowers, speak to us on such a level that it's, it gets us in here and we're like, we understand where it's coming from at first, but uh, it leads us down the garden path, basically. <laughs> it leads us to a pagan witchy uh, style of life and opens us up like I said you know it's just all sort of keys to unlocking who we are rather than oh this is this is the path and then we're walking it it's all these things that just sort of unlock us a little bit and help to garner understanding about the world around us and I think the sabbats can be really beautiful and they don't have to be elaborate rituals if you don't want to quite frequently with it being just me I will do simplified nature-based stuff and the the ritual doesn't have to be highly stylized every single time and in the beginning I was you know when you're reading all the Wiccan books and the Wiccan books do it this way and you must open the circle this way and you must do it this, this way I mean I never fully uh, <laughs> agreed to the book's way of doing things because I was always argumentative with the books even in the beginning uh, but you get caught up in the, oh, it has to be very, very this, and ha it has to include this, and and rather than feeling it out your own way. Because when you sit and think about it, it could just be that you sat out in the garden, weather permitting, we are in England. Um, <laughs> me, myself, and I being we. Um, and just to connect to what's going on around you, and just be honouring uh, the way of the world around you. And I think... I tend to take certain things into uh, my Wheel of the Year celebrations and leave other things out. Like the very defined Wiccan, what's going on with the God and Goddess in in the sort of Wiccan over, over type of the connection of all of the, the Wheel of the Year uh, was something that never really sat with me, uh, you know. At, at this this point, the goddess gives birth to the, to the god, and I understand why all of that imagery comes from. But after a while, it became something that didn't quite sit with how I was connecting to my path. And given that I follow the goddess Morrigan and the Celtic path, it meant that I was looking at Celtic t interpretations of what was going on at the festivals and looking at how I would apply sort of more Celtic feelings to other, the other <laughs> uh, sabbats that weren't necessarily Celtic in origin, you know, but they all have a much older history than just being presented uh, in Wicca, but I think the Wheel of the Year as we know it now is obviously based in the, the Wiccan books, but uh, they all have much older origins, you know, little threads that you can pull on and, and feel and, and look back at how humanity was and when humanity tended to celebrate uh, their connection with nature a lot more because they weren't so removed from it. And I think that's possibly one of the key things that celebrating the Wheel of the Year does. It takes us back to a mindset where we realise that we pretty much are, for the most part, not everybody. Obviously, some people are fortunate. But for most of us, we're pretty disconnected from nature in so much as we don't respect her enough. And this is to do with the fact that 
we live in homes with central heating and running water and it's all taken care of and we never even have to think about it you know we don't think about central heating we don't think about electricity we don't think about cooking our food we don't think about food at all uh, in the sense that f for most of us we're not going to go without in some form but whereas people who were living off the land and if the harvest failed and then they would starve it was a much much closer much more symbiotic relationship with nature and that's changed and there is no denying it in in the western world anyway and um for most of us it's not true for everybody obviously uh but i, I can only talk to you about my experience and i'm not living off the sweat of my brow farming on land and pulling up crops and it's, it's not plausible even. I couldn't grow my own food here even if I wanted to. I wouldn't be allowed. Um, and it's just... A li we've become a little bit depersonalised, I think, to nature in a lot of ways. And I think that celebrating the Wheel of the Year can take us back. It can take us back to looking at a different way of life when people were that connected and thinking about what that would be like and really starting to consider it, you know? And then also to honour and celebrate our connection with nature, what's going on in the world, and giving back in a, a number of ways. Uh, a lot of people I know plant seeds at Imbol, and that becomes part of their ritualistic worshipping of nature and connectivity to nature. Again, that's Northern Hemisphere though. Just, just to be clear. So I think that's that's <laughs> crazy lighting. I think that's all I can really offer with regards to uh, the the wheel of the year. I've covered it quite frequently, so I don't really want to hash over old ground again and again. You know, so there is more information on my channel if you're interested in in certain spells and certain rituals and. Uh, even videos where you follow me around. <laughs> like Crazy Stalker for Imbolc or whichever festival it was. <laughs> like it was. Um, but yeah, so I hope this was somewhat informative. Um, I hope so. Many blessings. <laughs>